Hello everyone, it's your host, Seth the Programmer, and today we're going to be doing a nether narrative analysis video on Dragon Ball. This one in particular will be in defense of the Goku vs. Moro battle at the end of the arc and a few things leading up to it. Now, I'm not here to try and preach that Dragon Ball is the greatest written thing of all time, but I'm really tired of people acting like it doesn't have any good writing qualities whatsoever and just treating it like an Ooga Booga manga and nothing okay. else. If you guys do like this breakdown, I did do a breakdown of every other arc of Dragon Ball in my The Strength of Sun Goku video, which a lot of people say change the perspective on the series entirely i hope to do the same today so you might be immediately be asking yourself seth how does a character like moro who pulled a frieza pulled a cell pulled a majin Buu, pulled a babidi pulled a zamasu pulled a goldo pulled a king piccolo pulled a vegeta pulled a pretty much everyone have any redeemable qualities whatsoever. How does Goku versus Moro, which has the Sensu Bean scene, Goku trying to befriend him like a stereotypical battle, overshadowing Vegeta's character, etc., have any redeemable qualities? Well, to get into that, we first need to look into the base of it all, which is, what is the point of Moro? Who is Moro? And so on. Is he a generic anime bad villain? Perhaps, or maybe he's more than that. I think a good way to explain this is to go over the clear inspirations of the Moro arc in general. I think it's safe to say that most people would agree that Moro is in fact inspired by Galactus, both being world-eating forces of natures that consume life to sustain themselves, or their selves, and their powers. Without consuming planets, they seem to wither away and weaken. Both called the World Eater or World Devourer have their heralds to scout out planets with life, etc. Most would probably agree with this on a basic level. As we know, Toyotaro and Toriyama are very aware of Western media throughout their interviews, and even some of of their drawings. <coughs> Jack Kirby, the creator of Galactus, once stated, for some reason I went to the Bible and I came up with Galactus. And there I was in front of this tremendous figure who I knew very well because I've always felt him. I certainly couldn't treat him in the same way I could any ordinary mortal. And I remember in my first story, I had to back away from him to resolve that story. The Silver Surfer is, of course, the Fallen Angel. He didn't want to create some thugs or gangsters anymore. He needed something new. For Dragon Ball, Moro would be Galactus and Mirus would be the Silver Surfer, also known as the Fallen Angel. Galactus is often described as the ultimate danger or the final danger, an ultimate villain. Now, while Dragon Ball doesn't copy-paste Galactus here, this leads into something important later I'll discuss. You can also see this biblical-style influence of Galactus in Moro as well. With him being pretty much a literal goat-slash-ram figure, it'd be very likely to say that Moro is a very PG depiction of, say, Baphomet, which he is often shown pointing up and down when using his abilities similar to Baphomet and as a similar and once again PG appearance. Goats are often referenced as very selfish creatures that embody concepts of sin and evils, whereas most religions try to teach people to be one body, hence the selfish goat is usually the antithesis of these beliefs. In this sense, Moro is a force of nature for the main characters that almost does things as if a force of evil instead, not worrying about good or evil, but only himself. Normally you'd argue that he is just pure evil, much say like Frieza, however Moro's justifications are that he he is not doing things just to be evil or for his ego necessarily. He genuinely feeds off of these beings and planets like an animal in the wild preys on others. But this selfishness for his own survival is what makes him evil to others. That isn't to say he isn't a cunt. Okay, Seth, so that's the basis and we understand he's inspired now. How does that make the actual events that happen redeemable? So do I have a story for you? Cartoon time! Yeah! yeah! The Moro arc begins with Goku not being able to utilize Ultra Instinct. If you watched my Strength of Sun Goku video, this means that Goku doesn't realize himself as much as he thinks he does, and he might have been brought to that character arc or mindset on accident against Jiren. For Goku to advance, he needs to consciously understand what actually happened, thus introducing Mirus, who is a strange galactic patrol member who can even subdue Goku and catch Vegeta by surprise. Vegeta, who is known to not let his guard down, Mirus then informs them they need Majin Buu to unleash the Grand Supreme Kai and seal away a powerful enemy with no limits to his power, known as Moro, who has fled from prison. Goku then searches for Moro himself and finds him, but Moro can backtrack anybody that senses him and immediately senses they are looking for him. 
immediately you can see there is a slight difference in Moro. Instead of the usual Supreme Kai, we are now working with the Grand Supreme Kai. And this spell will not be caught off guard like many enemies before. He is immediately aware of anybody seeking him. His aura is also different. Instead of just being a strong key, Moro's key is the souls of everyone and every planet he's ever devoured screaming in pain. And when you sense him, you can feel and hear this pain itself. Off the bat, he is eerie, in a similar sense to First Form Cell, after devouring a lot of humans, but on a higher scale. Moro was also sealed off just like King Piccolo, and re-emerges much older and weaker. He also has a ship similar to him as well. Just like Piccolo, Moro seeks the Dragon Balls to return his powers, and just like Frieza, he seeks them on Namek. In fact, it is directly referenced Moro sought the Dragon Balls on Namek exactly like Frieza, because one of Frieza's soldiers that are with him told him the story. Later, Goku and Vegeta have contact with Moro, and Moro recognizes the talent and powers of them. We then learn Moro is a master of illusions and magic, like Deborah and Babidi, and defeats Goku and Vegeta by using his absorption powers, like the androids, but on a higher scale. During the fight, Moro actually tries a similar attack as Goldo using sharpened trees and telekinesis, which Vegeta actually calls him out for and mocks him for. Moro is also shown then using the spirit bomb concept, but against them. It might be interesting to note he might actually be the originator of this sort of technique entirely. The attack that brings everyone together to destroy evil foes is actually a variation of Dragon Ball Satan's ultimate jutsu, which, once again, is important. The beginning fights and moments for this arc are actually focused on developing Vegeta. For instance, Moro says at full power, I would crush you like a bug to bait Vegeta, but Vegeta says he doesn't care and wants to kill him instead. Obviously, a clear contrast to how he was in the Android arc, or the Cell arc. Vegeta also wants to actively atone and protect Namek, rather than just seek a strong opponent for his pride. I don't want to talk about Vegeta too much here, but just know that that's what a lot of this arc is. But this video is focusing on Goku versus Moro, not necessarily Vegeta. After defeating Goku and Vegeta, Moro seeks the villages of Namek just like Frieza, but he is a higher caliber and doesn't need a scouter to do so. Nobody can hide from Moro like they could from Frieza, he will absolutely obtain the Dragon Balls unless directly confronted. Namekian warriors come to stop Moro, just like they did Frieza, but this time they fuse together into a super warrior. Moro then proceeds to kill them without even looking at him. Once again, a step above. Just like the Mafuba with King Piccolo, they want the Grand Supreme Kai to seal away Moro again. Majin Buu then comes in and faces Moro and beats on him in a similar way he beat Majin Vegeta back in the day. However, Moro still has more up his sleeve after making excuses like Second Form Cell did after losing, which Buu makes fun of him for. Moro also has a habit of stabbing people like Dr. Jiro did Yamcha, which he does brutally numerous times throughout this arc. Like First Form Cell, Moro can also hide his power to flee and seek more power from fighting Majin Buu. The Grand Supreme Kai then revives Goku and Vegeta, with the cast constantly referring to Moro as the villain. The Grand Supreme Kai fighting Moro is important because it's almost like a God versus Satan style battle. This was somewhat hinted at in the Buu Saga as well, but in this stage, it's more legitimate than before, featuring the actual Grand Supreme Kai at his full abilities and Dragon Ball Baphomet. Another interesting quality Moro has is that he can actually force himself into the memories of others and learn that the Grand Supreme Kai's powers were obliterated with Kid many years ago. Not even planning and thinking to yourself in solitude are safe from Moro. There really is nothing that can kind of escape him. Majin Buu fighting Moro is also very important, so keep that note in your head. After winning another skirmish, Moro wants to let all the strong fighters roam around and do as they please after sparing them, and believes they will return to him, just like Goku Black and Zamasu did to Goku, Vegeta, and Trunks. In fact, later, once he learns they are training, he wants to allow them to train so that he can devour more energy from them, a similar thing that Perfect Cell did with the Cell games. For once in Vegeta's life, he realizes that physical might won't be the end-all to winning a fight, and wants to find a way around this. Goku then begins training with Miris. Miris teaches Goku Ultra Instinct is the opposite of everything that has carried the Saiyans to where they are. It is the opposite of rage, grief, and joy that translated to prodigious power. Everything the characters have used to this point to win will not work against Moro anymore. The characters need to change. Miris and Goku then train in a hyperbolic time chamber that isn't as exaggerated as the one on Earth. Instead of one day per year, it's one day for three days. So with the two months they have to train for Moro, thanks to Jacko, Goku has six months. Once again, 
This is upping the stakes compared to So, in which against So, both Goku and Vegeta had a year, with Goku taking a little less time than that on purpose. Also like with Cell, they are training for the time that Moro granted them to grow stronger to please his needs. Mirus and Goku also get to know each other very well in the hyperbolic time chamber, which I will go into later. Mirus also hints that Goku will need to be mentally shocked or put into a deathly situation to truly have to calmly access Ultra Instinct from his shock. Foreshadowing. We then learn that Whis has been watching this whole time and reports this to the Grand Priest. It is revealed that Mirus is in fact an angel in training, but he is a troublemaker who has begun to sympathize with mortals too much due to his time in the Galactic Patrol. Whis, fearing for Mirus, comes to take him back to the godly realms and the training with Goku is stopped short before he can go all out versus him. Goku then proceeds to get lost in space and ask directions from space squids or something. We then introduce 7-3 an artificial life form with infinite stamina. Sound familiar? It faces down against Piccolo and Gohan and is inevitably stopped by androids 17 and 18, who 7-3 can't steal and absorb the powers of. The androids fighting 7-3 is important, so keep another note of that. Moro then lands on Earth. The time is up. When he lands, he exclaims a new level of power and shows that he can empower his henchmen to the point they literally explode, just like Babidi could. In the fight, Goku begins to use Ultra Instinct Sign, or Omen, we'll call it Sign for now. In Sign, he is in a technique of the gods that makes Moro very excited, and during the battle, Moro uses a technique similar to Kefla in which he shoots lightning all over while Goku dodges while utilizing a Kamehameha, or charging a Kamehameha. This one is weird since Kefla only really did that versus Goku in the anime, but we'll give it a pass in a symbolic sense and say that's what they were referencing. We then see parallels in Goku versus Moro similar to Goku fighting many other characters, in which Moro blocks Goku's Kamehameha just like Frieza 50% power did against Kaioken times 20 Goku, and just like that fight, Moro is not at full power and Goku's stamina is draining rapidly with his technique or current form he is using, and he can't hold out like this. Also, this is going to be a tad off topic from what I'm going for, but people really get mad here that Goku yells when he powers up against Moro, which I'm assuming most of them are a bunch of nerds, no offense, but they get mad because Ultra Instinct is supposed to be a calm mind, the opposite of rage, grief, and joy. However, yelling does not mean you aren't calm of mind or filled with rage, grief, and joy. The yelling here is more like if I had to explain when you lift heavy weights and you yell or make noises instinctually that helps you kind of motivate your body. It has nothing to do with him being like in an angry state of mind or something. It's like questioning why someone yells out in pain when they get punched. What? Goku just screamed when he got punched in the mouth? Not my Ultra Instinct. That Jedi just groaned in pain when he got kicked in the face. Is he succumbing to the dark side? Making these noises can, in fact, be instinctual. Not only that, but Goku isn't even in the completed Ultra Instinct form to begin with. Anyway, before I go on to a longer tangent... When are y'all gonna get to the goddamn point? Goku and Moro's auras class just like they did in Goku vs. Piccolo Jr., obviously on a more intense and larger degree. Goku then gets throttled trying to rely on power like he did against Jiren, showing he perhaps really didn't understand why he truly did what he did in the Tournament of Power after all. This power-up attempt actually nerfs Goku instead of empowering him, as he isn't listening to Mirus' teachings on how Ultra Instinct work. Beerus then overhears Mirus and Whis talking about the fight and learns Goku will not win. Beerus then says he wants to go to Earth for food. Many people question Beerus here. One thing about the gods is that they have to act on their biases towards mortals in a very subtle way. Beerus in this case usually claims he only wants to help Goku in the game because of food, but we learn it's a bit deeper than that which is shown later in this arc. Whis is pretty similar but much more subtle as he has to be. I'll get into this more later as well. Vegeta then goes full circle and uses his new spirit fishing ability he learned on Yardrat on Moro to give him a harder time than Goku did, showing a higher level of development as both a fighter and a character, sacking his pride in what he knew about fighting to try and genuinely learn how to get the victory and to atone himself. Now while Vegeta getting the win against Moro could have been fine here, it doesn't allow Goku to grow and once again misses the point of numerous arcs leading up to this, with everyone's strength becoming your strength and so on. Too much of a spit on the series for it to happen, unfortunately. In Vegeta's defense, he did outdo Goku pretty hard, having less training and still doing better, but I could talk about Vegeta in his own video if you guys want. I want to focus on Goku here. 
During the fight with Vegeta, Moro understands that they are both villains bound for hell. Both Moro and Vegeta are content with this and don't care. A lot of people question if Vegeta is really a villain. I say if you've murdered a million babies in the past and you haven't done it for 30 years, you're probably still considered a bad person. But there's debates to be had if Vegeta is actually a villain or not. He's, he's in the shoes of a good person at the moment, but he still has to atone and did bad things. That's basically what they're talking about. Also, Piccolo comments that Vegeta has genuinely changed thanks to Goku, but claims Goku's outlook on fighting is generally the same. I don't believe that Piccolo is saying Goku hasn't changed as a person at all, but more so why he fights is pretty much the same. I'll go into this more later. Piccolo also says Vegeta is not one to underestimate his opponents, which there's a whole debate about that and so many memes. I'm not going to try to defend it in this video. Moro that consumes 7-3 Cell style and achieves his perfect Voro form. Moro also copied Vegeta's abilities, but they are permanent, making him immune to fusion unlike any other character in the series, so no Vegito or Gogeta to save the day. Once again, another step up from other antagonists. Moro also gains the ability to regenerate, and after having his arm blasted off like Zamasu, simply grows it back and almost kills Goku in one hit. Thanks to Beerus coming to Earth, Miras steps in and dukes it out with Moro. For the time being, Miras is using earthly tools and isn't genuinely fighting Moro yet, so he is safe. But he isn't able to fully hold off the new empowered Moro off with just his mortal powers. Moro then tags Miras and gets a grab on his neck, which Miras activates his angel powers to break free from. This hand then plops down like Buhan's tentacle versus Vegito back in the Buu Saga. This angel staff causes Miras to start to lose his form, and Goku begins to worry for Miras, telling him to stop. Miras then reveals the thing he wants to teach Goku is justice, something Goku never really cared about before. Goku did always have the, hey, knock it off attitude whenever he saw someone do something bad, but he never truly sought out peace on Earth or to prevent these bad things from ever happening again for the most part. Most of his fights were just life and death battles in which he got very excited and emotional turmoils happened and blah blah blah. This is described in a flashback in which Miras asks Goku why he actually fights. Miras says Goku has saved the universe many times in which Goku says he hasn't thought of it very much and that the strongest guys tend to be villains. Miras then asks Goku why he spares villains, in which Goku says if they rise up and do bad stuff again, he'll have to become stronger and he will fight them as many times as it takes until maybe one day they join the good side. Goku thinks Miras gives him way too much credit and that he only does it because it's just more exciting. Miras sees this, but still has something to teach Goku. Miras uses his full angel powers to eliminate Moro's copy ability. He begins to fade away and says, I've come to love this galaxy, this universe full of excitement, please protect it all, and vanishes from existence. Miras gives his entire existence to teach Goku to value justice and the universe that gives him excitement, and this message is not lost on Goku. Goku realizes that he shouldn't just be fighting for his own gain or simply excitement, but for others as well. He somewhat already did this naturally throughout the series, but now he is more consciously doing it. Miras and Jacko talk about how the Galactic Patrol reform and protects, and this chapter is now called Goku Galactic Patrol, and acknowledges his duty to protect the universe for the first time, and that Miras' will still lives on with him. Goku remembers and finally achieves Ultra Instinct's full power once again, but now it is more perfected than ever before. Goku easily thrashes Moro, but a new example of Goku's character must begin. Goku thrashes Moro on a level that impresses even the gods, and is called godlike by even Beerus, who respects Goku's new ability, which Whis is even surprised to hear. Moro starts calling himself the supreme life form on some perfect cell energy, and Goku lectures him about if he knows what it's like to be hurt like he did to others, similar to what he says to Frieza. He asks Moro to come to jail peacefully, similar to what he said to Frieza or what Vegito says to Buhan. He asks Moro to come to jail peacefully in which Moro obviously refuses. Goku then asks what the Galactic Patrol would do here, in which Jacko says he should kill Moro now. Goku then says he quits the Galactic Patrol, and wants to face Moro as an Earthling. This isn't to disrespect Miras, by the way, as Goku later says he must face Moro to protect the galaxy in Miras' honor, but imagine the next set of events is Goku's answer to Miras' lesson and his question in the Hyperbolic Time Chamber. This begins by Goku giving Moro a Sensu Bean. Many people immediately get mad at this, thinking that Goku is making the same mistakes as he did against Cell. However, that is not what is happening at all. 
The problem with Goku giving the bean to Cell is that Goku is trying to prove his successor could defeat the past generation of fighters in Cell and was willing to heal Cell and possibly torment Gohan to prove it. In this instance, it is more similar to what he did with Piccolo Jr., in which Goku is actively trying to give Moro a chance at redemption, just like he did against Piccolo after their fight. This has nothing to do with Cell. It isn't even referencing Cell. This is also important, which I will outline later. Moro then pulls a Frieza when Super Saiyan Goku gave him energy on Namek, and Goku easily knocks away his attack, and Moro even snaps his hand on Goku's body, trying to test his mercy. Goku then asks Moro if he's ever trained, but Moro responds, it's a crutch for the weak. Goku says it's a shame because he's stronger than anybody he's ever fought. Video note here, there is a debate if toughest means strongest, which I would argue it is referring to Moro being the strongest due to Goku talking about villains being the strongest guys he's ever fought before. But if you want to take it as Goku just saying he's a tough guy, that is fine too. Thumbs up. Both work for the narrative of a hand. I'm not claiming one or the other. Moro then pulls a Buhan and absorbs Miris' power from the hand dropped from earlier. By the way, I called this on stream months in advance. I'm actually a god, thank you. Goku now has to surpass Miris, or in a less physical sense, the Galactic Patrol, and prove his answer is correct while Moro utilizes Ultra Instinct. After a long battle and many more villain references, Moro goes giant perfect cell mode and begins to freak out as his body can't withstand angel powers anymore. Whis warns Goku to finish Moro off now, or else things will get out of hand. And before he can, Moro fuses with the Earth like fusions of Masu fuse with the universe in the anime, although this time it's not on a larger scale, and this seems to be more of an extension to second form Cell about to self-destruct the Earth than Zamasu, as Goku can't just teleport Moro away like he could Cell, thus raising the stakes. Beerus comes in and resolves himself to help seal Moro away, once again proving what I said earlier, and even Whis, the unbiased angel, biasly gives Goku advice on how to defeat Moro. Whis also tells Goku to have faith in his own strength, but this fails, and Goku cannot stop Moro alone. This is because, as we learned in my last video, Goku's strength is the strength of others becoming his own which Whis may not fully understand, or maybe Whis was referencing that strength and he's actually incredibly based. Everyone comes together to repower Goku, including Oob, the reincarnation of Evil Boo, and Goku shatters Moro, which brings a smile to Whis's face. Miris is then revived in exchange for its angel powers and fulfills the whole fallen angel thing I talked about earlier. I'll now wrap this up for those that don't get it. Moro is the amalgamation or representation of every villain Goku and gang have ever faced. He is the villain trope personified. In a similar way Jiren was the representation of Goku and what he thought he wanted, Moro is the representation of Goku's struggles, villains, and developments. This is why Moro kept seemingly almost purposely doing what every past villains were doing. Some people call this lazy, but we know that Toriyama and Toyotaro can avoid repeating tropes and be creative. But this time, they went out of their way to not only blatantly copy, but even reference what they were copying literally when it happens within their own story. This, alongside the Galactus inspiration of being the ultimate danger and villain, is exactly what Moro is, the ultimate villain or danger for Goku to show his answer to. But something you'll notice is that many of these characters that criticize Goku were villains as well. Piccolo, the reincarnation of evil, Vegeta, the Saiyan prince, the androids built to torment and destroy, and even Majin Buu, the being who almost annihilated the whole universe. Even Frieza, the Emperor of Evil, defended the universe during the Tournament of Power. And finally, after it all, Goku's selfish desire for excitement and Evil Buu's reincarnation comes in the form of Oob, what most would call one of Goku's biggest mistakes and allowing Kid Buu to even appear now becomes his greatest strength and greatest tool in defending the universe and he destroys Moro. If you still don't get it with that, Goku's answer to the Galactic Patrol and even Miris is that reforming and teaching others, including villains, to value the excitement of the universe can help defend the universe and justice even more than they can. Goku's lesson is now complete. He now values justice, protecting others, and understands that working together with all, including those who people think are worthless villains, 
is his final answer, and it wasn't Goku that saved the universe numerous times, but this lesson.